blood carrier, like your AB negative or B negative or O negative or A negative, then that part of the world may have no blood available for you and some of these things you don't think about for travel. Uh, you need a brief report explaining any serious medical condition that you might have, be that serious allergic, such as you're allergic to bees, be that you have diabetes or epilepsy or um, can't eat nuts or whatever. And if you are one of those people with serious allergic allergies, then the medic alert bracelets or necklaces are international and people will look for them. Go right ahead. Um, the most commonly acquired travel related disease worldwide is hepatitis A. It is through food and water and it follows, which you're going to hear a lot of, the fecal oral route. From someone's food into the feces, out that way, and vice versa. From the feces into your food, out that way, a water supply. Years ago, we used to give an ugly vaccine called immune globulin in the butt. That no longer is given, and we give a very specific hepatitis A vaccination. It is also really smart for people in the United States, and in some parts of this country, in the western part of this country, is required vaccination for childhood because they've seen increases in hepatitis A even in this country, uh, either in indigenous people in certain parts of the country or in food that's imported, like you've heard about Taco Bells with spring onions or green onions or raspberries imported with hepatitis A. So if you have not had this vaccination, a single shot gives you protection for a year and a, another shot six months to a year or any time after will booster that and give you protection most likely for life. Go ahead. Hepatitis B, we did ask you for this information on your health report that you sent us. Um, all international students had to prove this, American students didn't. So if you have not had hepatitis B, the risk of hepatitis B in travel depends on behavior and length of stay, they figure. Obviously, if you're in my profession and handling needles and taking care of sick people where blood exposure is a risk, then you have to have this vaccination. Hepatitis B, unlike hepatitis A, is transmitted through blood and body fluid. It's a way stronger virus than HIV or a lot of other ones. It can literally live outside on the blood for hours or perhaps even a day. So it is a, a very serious vaccine. Fifteen percent of the people who are exposed to hepatitis B die. And then the rest can be left, either your immune system takes care of it, or you become a carrier, or it's something that you deal with the rest of your life. You might have heard of hepatitis C. We do not have a vaccine for that, and it's transmitted the same way as, as you know, HIV differently. So, and we're going to talk about that a little later. No tattoos, no body piercing. You wouldn't want to go to any dentist anywhere in the world without making sure they're using sterile instruments. You wouldn't want to have a shot or a needle from somebody unless you knew it was sterile and they were a single-use thing. You wouldn't want to have a razor sh shave on a street if you're a guy because they use the same razor blade and stuff like that. I'll throw in my, uh, and, and please ask questions, and I like to have a little fun with you guys. My brother-in-law, ex-brother-in-law, who flew internationally from a major organization, hated going into Bombay, but would go into Bombay, and he'd, he would go to Walmart before he took his flight to buy sneakers he would throw away in the airport on his way home. Little did he know, until they found out, that one day he was in his room, hotel room, and he stepped out when the cleaning lady came and then remembered he forgot something, went back in to find her brushing her teeth with his toothbrush. So part of hepatitis B is we may never know how we were exposed, but there you go. <laughs> So we have a perfectly good vaccination for hepatitis B. If you've completed that series, which is a three-shot series, it's good for the rest of your life also. No one has ever acquired hepatitis B after being properly immunized. Go ahead. Twinrix, for those who have not had A and B, is the combination and is ideal if you've never had A and B to get this vaccination as it does have both of those in there. It is also a three-shot series. There's the routine... Uh, day 0, day 30, and day 180 um, to get in. Go ahead. 
You know about measles, mumps, and rubella. You all had to prove it before you came to school. It is the routine diseases that we see in country. If you've had this twice, it's probably good for a life, though. Go ahead. Diphtheria tetanus is every 10 years. And if you've not had this within 10 years, it's really something you should get. It's worldwide. It's in the United States. It's everywhere. And it needs to be sure if you've had diphtheria tetanus, not within 10 years, that you get a booster for this, because it's really silly to die of something that was vaccine uh, preventable. Go right ahead. <coughs> Again. Again. Polio. For those of you that are going to Mali and Senegal, they've already have come in. One of the vaccines that you need a booster on is polio, because although we had hoped to evac to um, eliminate polio from the world uh, by the year 2000, that did not happen. It has actually been reintroduced in a lot of countries. I think there's about 30 or 40 countries where polio still is a problem. You need boostering. A lot of those are in Africa, so that's what we recommend that for. Go ahead. How is polio transmitted? It is transmitted several ways. Food, water, airborne. That's why it was so easily transmitted early on. Um, it's quite easily transmitted person to person, etc. Meningococcal vaccine. Um, the belief is now, actually it was on the news last night. Now, I bet you most of you have had your meningococcal vaccine because it was recommended or required for your college undergraduate degree. Well, we had a case just a little while ago where someone who was immunized with one shot of meningococcal vaccine did still get meningitis in this country. So they're now going to perhaps a two shot and every three years you need a booster. For the kids going to Mali or Senegal, it is recommended because the type of meningococcal disease we see in this country is type C. What they're seeing in the savannah region of Africa is two other types that are also included in that vaccine. So boostering may be recommended. And you all know what meningitis is, right? Okay. Other childhood vaccines, these are things we're looking for that you have. Go ahead. Also, big, big reason we're, we're getting everybody both for our campus health, so you can go to class during our flu season, which is normally Thanksgiving through April. That's why we started the vaccines in, in mid-October, so that they would last the full six months. And we also recommended for travel, this year it has the H1N1 in it, as well as influenza A and B. And you, you never know who you sit on next to on a plane who may be carrying disease, and you don't want to get sick in country. Or if you really get sick and you need help right away, they may not have it. Yes? Yeah, um, what are the side effects of influenza vaccines? Like all the vaccines, the, the side effects are quite similar. It is an inactivated killed vaccine. Uh -huh. So you cannot get the disease from the vaccine. Redness and soreness at the site is the uh, most common that anybody gets from any vaccine. Three to five percent may get tiredness, malaise, flu-like feeling, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, low grade, um, and that's it. There are people who should not get these vaccines, and that's why we have a checkoff sheet. A lot of them have been started in an egg embryo, so if you're allergic to eggs, you can't have it. If you have a serious immune disorder, you may not be able to have certain vaccines. If you are sick the day you want the flu vaccine with a fever, you should not have it. If you're pregnant, you should not have it. If you're taking cortisones or steroids for a reason, you may not be able to have them. And if you're on anti-cancer drugs, it's another reason why a lot of people are. Otherwise, most people can have these vaccines. <coughs> Go ahead. We're not going to worry too much about Japanese encephalitis. No one is going to Southeast Asia, right? We can skip that. Rabies pre-exposure vaccination <coughs> is recommended for long-term stays where uh, you might be in a very remote location. So if you were bitten by a rabid animal, we're going to talk about this more, uh, that you would have a delay getting out to find a source to begin post-exposure. So the pre-exposure only buys you time to find post-exposure. It is a three-shot series, very expensive. Go ahead. Again. 
A lot of you will be getting typhoid. It's recommended worldwide. Again, another fecal oral root disease. Typhi, salmonella. Uh, we have two types of vaccines for that. I try to be the kind of gentler person, believe it or not, and give the oral vaccine versus the injectable if you're, uh, by your history, are capable of taking that. The oral vaccines last for five years. The injection lasts only for two years. Go ahead. Yes? What's the effectiveness of the typhoid vaccine? What's the what? The effectiveness. It's much better. The effectiveness of uh, both the vaccines run around 70%. It's really, they've done some good studies on it. Yellow fever. A lot of you have been coming in quick so you can get the yellow fever vaccine so you can get your visas. Um, yellow fever is in the Amazon basin and in Africa. And yellow fever is a mosquito-borne disease. It's a viral illness and it is deadly. Like 40% that get it just die and then it's, you know, uh, it can be very serious to treat. So here we have a safe vaccine that you can get. 100% effective, one of the few that we can say 100% effective, lasts for 10 years. Go ahead. These are the ones we don't have. In the United States, there's no cholera vaccine, and you'll be maybe going to a country where cholera is a, is a problem. Another fecal oral disease, we'll talk about it. You've heard the thing, cholera happening in Haiti now. Go ahead. Lyme disease, we had a vaccine for it, removed. We don't have a disease for that, go ahead. We don't have? A vaccine for hepatitis C, and many of you may not know that we're down to the letter H in different <coughs> typings of hepatitis, but we only have A and B. Half of them are transmitted through food and water, and half of them are fecal oral root transmission. Go ahead. Obviously, you know we don't have a vaccine for HIV, even though they've been trying for 20, 35 years now. Go ahead. No vaccine for dengue, so you have to avoid the bite of the mosquito. Go ahead. And obviously, no vaccine for malaria, but thanks to the Gates, uh, they are working very hard and putting millions of dollars behind it to come up with a vaccine. All right, go ahead. Deb, uh, Alex, one more time. The type of <coughs> yellow fever, do students who go to Turkey need the vaccine? Turkey, you would need the oral, the, any of the fecal oral root ones. Okay. Yeah. And there was, um, the UN just put out their report on malaria and they're finding resistance to malaria medication. There's that, always been resistance. It's worse. It is always worse. It's a growing concern. Uh, and, and we'll talk about that when we get to okay. malaria. So, one of the big problems that everybody suffers with is allergies. So if you know that you have significant allergies and you're traveling, you need to expect that you're going to have the same trouble <coughs> where you're going. Uh, if it's house dust or mites, you may bring your own uh, over-the-counter medis medicine or prescription like Claritin or Zyrtec. And for some of you, who's going to Morocco? Anybody in this group going to Morocco? Turkey. You're going to find a lot of dust and you're going to find a lot of mold. So if that's a problem, that's going to be that. Some people have contact dermatitis, like we have lovely poison ivy around here, which is still not dead. Um, so bring your, uh, you know, creams like hydrocortisone and stuff with you. Some people were leaving, and it is a sunny Vermont day, thank you, but you may be going to really sunny locations closer to the equator, and a lot of people have sun allergies as well as um, needing to use it for sunscreen <coughs> protection. Serious allergies to bees, you've got to be sure you, be, you bring your EpiPens or bee sting kits with you, two of those, so be sure you do that. Skin reactions and food allergies, of course, you may have food allergies. Uh, if you're serious allergic to a certain food, such as shrimp, and you're going, let's say, to Vietnam, which I know none of you are, everything is shrimp-based. So you're asking for trouble when that's the location you're going to. Or if you're serious allergic to um, um, nuts, and you find that nuts are the main source of the diet, that can be a serious issue. Issue. So check into that before you go, bring everything with you. Go ahead. And again. So the best thing for fighting infections, and what you're going to fight is the same things you basically fight here, plus a few additional. Immunize yourself as much as possible because your own immunity will develop antibodies to fight off the infections. Go ahead. <clears throat> if possible, bring any medications with you. If you know that part of your medical history that you have, ear infections, if you have urinary tract infections, 
if you have other skin infections, like you get staph infections. If it happens here, it's most likely to happen there. And if you're going from a lovely cold climate to a nice warm climate, you will find that some things uh, like infections of the skin might be a big problem. <coughs> Go ahead. Wound bites. Go ahead. You need to prepare yourself in case you have a cut of any type, but we're basically talking about wound bites. So you need to have antiseptic soap and betadine and first aid cream and sterile gauze and dressing to take. You need to know that wound bites occur worldwide in huge numbers. Yes? What is betadine? It is an iodine-based uh, bacterial soap. Go ahead. <clears throat> anything, anybody see anything wrong with this picture? Besides a guy holding, or a girl holding a bat down with a thumb? They carry rabies? That's right. One percent of all bats worldwide carry rabies. This is from one of our study abroad programs. I'm not happy about this picture. Uh, they should have protective uh, gloves on to avoid a bite. But again, bats worldwide, so as long as you stay in a well-screened place at night, bats won't be a problem, but if not, that can be a problem. Go ahead. Again. Stay away from the monkeys. <laughs> I have a really, uh, one, of, one of the uh, people that work for me uh, has a picture of her hair in Central America just with having a picture taken just before the monkey is biting. And the monkey's mouth is wide open heading for her. So monkeys do carry rabies. They also carry a lot of horrible diseases like herpes and hepatitis B and a whole bunch of other great stuff. So you don't want to play with them. Avoid all mammals. Dogs, cats, bats worldwide are the predominant carriers of rabies, but any mammal can. If bitten, it is extremely important. It's in the saliva where rabies exists. It's a viral infection transmitted by a mammal. You need to wash the wound vigorously like you're scrubbing for an operating room case for 20 to 30 minutes to get as much of that virus out of the wound as possible. Apply a dressing. Seek medical help immediately. It follows the neuro pathway to the brain. So if you're bitten on the big toe, it's got a ways to get to the brain. If you're bitten viciously around the neck of the face, you may have 24 to 48 hours to begin post-exposure or once you have a symptom, you just don't survive it. So begin immunization with 24 to 48 hours. Now some of you in remote locations may have to get many back to South Africa, Europe, or other places to find a safe place to get post-exposure. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Again. Vector-borne diseases mean diseases carried by insects. So we know the mosquito carries malaria and dengue. We know ticks carry typhus and Lyme disease. The kissing bug or the assassin bug in Central South, South America calls carry Chagas disease. Sand fleas carry lesmaniasis, the tsetse fly, American sleeping sickness, etc. So you need to avoid bug bites at all ways you can. Go ahead. Again. Insect proof your space, again. Store food properly. That means you should have some plastic bags with you so you can store it so nothing can get into it, such as rodents or flies, etc. Go ahead. Dispose of garbage immediately and away from your living space. Go ahead. Water tanks should be screened, particularly in Africa. If you're getting any uh, fresh water, it needs to be screened so mosquitoes don't lay in there and stuff. Go ahead. Uh, you need to use a bug repeller. Uh, deep. D-E-E-T, the active ingredient in most bug repellents, stands for diethylalulotolulamide, um, is, is the most common thing you see in bug repellents off any of those things that are on the market. The only place that you need, when you are where there are vector-borne diseases, the only part of your body that you should have to put lotion on is your hands and face. The rest of you should be covered up with long sleeve clothing, long pants, etc. Even if you're in a warm climate, even in India they do this, they have very light clothes, but they're covered up. So you should think about that. Go ahead. Screening should be in good repair so mosquitoes don't get in at night. Go ahead. 
bed nets are treated with permethrin. This is what has been happening um, before uh, the Gates started giving uh, money. They had figured out how do we help the indigenous people of Africa. Four or six million people or more die of malaria every year. <coughs> Just by giving them nets to sleep under has, it has definitely lowered the number. So it's important. Permethrin is made from a daisy type of chrysanthemum. And it's all those clothes you see in wilderness stores now called bug off. And it's in stay on clothing for up to six months. You can wash it, you can put it on tents, etc. So they use it on bed nets. It really works good. Go ahead. You need to avoid certain areas at sundown. Do you know when the most popular time mosquitoes bite is? Sunset. Cocktail hour. <laughs> so everybody sits outside having a cocktail five to six or so. That's when you're likely to get bitten. So it's crucial that you're aware of that. Go ahead. So you're going to wear those long sleeve, long pants, and closed shoes hopefully with permethrin. And, and this is available uh, on the market to buy. It's supposedly very, very safe. The only thing it's not safer is fish. It isn't something you dump in the water, but go ahead. Okay. You do all. Keep going. That's it. These are the main anti-malarials that we have out there. Each one has uh, benefits and side effects, has resistance and non-resistance. <coughs> Um, expensive and less expensive, and we're going to go a little bit about this, okay? Go ahead. And again. The first one I'm going to bring up is the hated, dreadful malaria mefloquine that everybody has heard terrible things about. It is used in Africa widely. It is a very safe drug for most people. One in 145 will have a side effect from it. I had one of those. The most common side effect is vivid dreams or dizziness. I had vivid dreams. I had psychotic spots all over the place, primarily the night, the day I took it. And after that was mine. If you are prone to nightmares, if you have a sleep disorder, if you have a history of anxiety or depression, panic attacks, anything else like that, or if you have a history of psoriasis or eczema, this is not the drug for you. It does tend to have, if, if we go into those 145 people that most likely, more likely women than men, might have to do with body weight and stuff, um, slower to leave the body in women than it is in men, but basically its life cycle is two and a half weeks inside you, so it would probably be that way. Um, it is one of the cheaper alternatives. It is a weekly drug, and some people like to take that because it's up daily, it's weekly. So you start this one week before you go, each week while you're in the malaria area and each week for four weeks upon leaving, as you see some of the adverse side effects I put down there, when it gets to depression or psychosis, you get a warning. You don't wake up one day and become psychotic on this drug. <laughs> and many have. It's about one in 15,000 that will have this type of reaction. But what they've had is weeks before that of feeling more depressed, feeling more anxious, having difficulty sleeping, being... So they've had warnings, but they kept taking it. So if you have the warning, it's not a match for you, go on to something else. Okay? And if you have such conditions as eczema or psoriasis, it can exacerbate it. So that's why it's not recommended for those. Next. Again. Now, chloroquine is not used in Africa at all. It's for only the non-resistant areas in the world, which is primarily Central America, some of South and some of Southeast Asia. Um, it is a weekly medicine. We've been using this drug for 200 years. Um, it's once weekly beginning the same way I told you about with Larian. Side effects can be anything from headache to fatigue. We have rarely had problems, but some people might have a seizure from taking medication or pigment changes are things that I have seen. Very rare to have a seizure, but it can occur. Yes? I have a question. So, Kim, I had to take that last year when I went to Africa. You wouldn't have taken chloroquine. It was chloroquine. Well, then someone gave you the wrong drug. Well, it's supposed to be the refrigerated. Is it okay to just... No, it's not refrigerated. Okay. It doesn't have to be refrigerated. It's meant for tropical countries. Go ahead. Next one. And again, 
Doxycycline is a fancy type of tetracycline. It's from the cycline families of antibiotics. A lot of you might have taken this or may even be taking this for acne. It's, it's, it's a uh, primary treatment for acne. Um, it is one of the cheaper drugs you can take. It is daily, so you have to take it daily. And you have to stop this a day or two before you go. Each day while you're in country with malaria and malaria area, and each day for four weeks upon leaving the malaria area. The side effects tend to be primarily, it's such a good antibiotic, it kills the normal flora in your gut. So you may get low grade diarrhea or stuff like that. <laughs> also kills the normal bacteria in your vagina, so you might get yeast infections. It is also super sun sensitive. You will sunburn. Anybody will sunburn. So you have to use sunscreens with this, yes? Um, I don't recommend this one because if you miss one day, which I did, I just forgot one day and I got malaria. That is correct. So and it, it is recommended, and I won't, that, that's your recommendation, but I won't go along with that. Because I'm going to say every one of you are adults here, and you've got to remember to take the medicine as it's appropriately directed. It's the same thing with your birth control pill. You miss that, and what kind of problems can you get into? <laughs> okay? You gotta think of it the same way. It is a good drug, it does have side effects, but it is, a, a, for some people, it's a good option. Go ahead. This is the everybody's favorite drug now. It is the one with the least side effects. It is the one that uh, is only has to be taken seven days post-travel because it works on the malaria parasite as soon as you're bitten. Where the other three drugs only work on the malaria parasite when it goes in its reproduction phase. So this is the one that actively works on malaria as soon as you're bitten. Um, it is a combination drug, a total clone for ground. Uh, you take this a day before, each day where you're there, and each day for seven days upon leaving it. Same story, miss a pill, guess what you might get. Mm -hmm. So, what I have seen from side effects from this is, you can take this with food, and it seems to eliminate that nausea stuff. So, a lot of the antimalarials can be a little tough on the gut to take. You can take this with food and water. Um, and I have had a few people that have been allergic to this, like it can be allergic to anything else that I've read about. Bad news, it's eight or ten dollars a pill. So even with SIT insurance, your copay would be thirty dollars per month for this one. And those of you on other insurance would have to check to see that they even cover it. Of course, that's the answer. Best drug, most expensive. That's the way it goes here in this country, unfortunately. Next one. Primaquin, I'm not even really going to talk about. If for some reason you couldn't use anything I just told you about, then primaquin, which is a, what we call a, and it, it sounds bad, but it's got a good medical terminology, a terminal treatment for malaria. <laughs> Not meaning it makes you terminal. <laughs> meaning it makes the parasite terminal. So often if you get treatment for malaria, they'll give you like doxycycline to take first, and then primaquin you follow up with, because it terminates the possibility of malaria in your body. Um, for people who couldn't take the others, this is an option. This is one that if you miss a half a day and you forget to take the pill, you might get malaria. It's got a very short life. Okay? Again. So the areas where chloroquine resistance is, is predominantly the Amazon basin, including Panama, <coughs> Ecuador, Africa, and South, Southern Asia. Chloroquine is used and where predominantly in Central America, parts of South America, and Mid-Asia. One again. And here's a map that sort of outlines that. The red areas are where chloroquine works. The blue areas are where chloroquine is con resistance is confirmed. So it would be the other drugs. I'm sorry, the red area is where chloroquine does not work. The yellow area is where chloroquine works. And the green area is where there's only a tiny, tiny, tiny bit of malaria, so we don't really recommend any malaria prophylaxis. Okay? Go ahead. Again. Make your, remember what I said, whatever you normally suffer with here, you're going to suffer with there, so prepare by getting yourself whatever you need. Uh, be that medications or 
you know, getting your back in shape before you really got a hike or whatever it is. Go ahead. Again. <coughs> headaches. If you suffer from headaches here, you're going to suffer from headaches there. Bring your own medication. <coughs> but one thing you need to know about headaches. Seek medical help as soon as possible if you get a high fever, stiff neck, you're confused, have a severe headache, like if somebody says to me, how bad is your headache? Put it on a scale of 1 to 10 and you say it's a 10, it could be something else going on. An infection or a tumor or a blood um, aneurysm or a lot of other stuff. Always be aware of that. Go ahead. Again. Bring your glasses and contacts. Some people who wear contacts may find you can't wear the contacts because of dust and pollution and other issues, so bring your glasses. Just and safe. Go ahead. Again. Uh, people with ear infections. We hear about the ear infections and in flying, right? When you get on a plane with a cold, it's probably a good idea. If you get on a plane with a cold, that you take a decongestant 20 minutes before ascent and 20 minutes before descent. Otherwise, you can get that middle ear infection. People with external ear infections, if you're going to be swimming in the part of the world you're going to, shouldn't be in Mali and Senegal swimming unless it's a swimming pool or ocean water. Um, it is just a, an over-the-counter sort of thing you can put together to prevent ear infections. Go ahead. Again. Again, dental care. If you have any question about your dental health now, get it checked out because it's Murphy's Law. When you travel, you're going to have a problem. I did this before I did a four-week trip through Kenya and Tanzania, and I have a Maryland bridge in, worth about $4,000. As soon as I landed, it popped. So for the four weeks, I carried it in my pocket, praying I wouldn't lose it. Uh, you know, and those are the things that happen. You also don't want to go to any dentist anywhere in the world because of blood-borne pathogens, so think about that. Okay, go ahead, again. Back and neck problems tend to be a barometer of your overall health, so you've got to get yourself in some sort of shape to go. Uh, if you know you have back problems, you're probably going to take anti-inflammatories with you. You need to learn how to properly lift and stand, and it's those suitcases and backpacks that are, un that are too heavy or you're not wearing properly that's going to give you long-term back problems. So think about that when you pack. Go ahead. Okay. Most people don't know that a quarter of all the bones in your body live in one foot. The other quarter lives in the other foot. So feet are really a problem when you travel because you're going to have to do a lot of walking and a lot of different conditions. Common problems like calluses, corns, plantar warts. Plantar warts, how do you get those? They're a virus transmitted person to person. Those showers. And anywhere you walk, you shouldn't be in a shower, in a gym, in a public place without wearing a pair of rubber thongs on. And the same thing about when you travel. Bunions, ingrown toenails, athlete's feet, moist climates, loaded with funguses. It's going to happen. If you have a propensity for that, early treatment needs. Heel pain, blisters. Let me tell you, if you're wearing new shoes, break them in before you go. Go ahead. So, that's all right. Moleskin and blisters for shoe cushions, antifungal, and no self-surgery. If you think you've got an ingrown toenail and you're going to put a little knife to it, you're most likely going to introduce more bacteria than you're going to let out. And you're going to get really in trouble, especially in warm climate. So no self-surgery. Go ahead. Throw out those infected sneakers. They're just going to keep reinfecting you and seek help early. Go ahead. Everybody's favorite stuff we're talking about. Nick, hot burn happens. Uh, bring, you know, bring your own antacids, bland diets, avoid certain foods, citruses, alcohol, spicy foods for some people. But, and hemorrhoids happen. One in three individuals, human beings, get hemorrhoids sometime in their life. When you, when you travel, your diet is going to radically change. So you need to be sure that you can maintain good bowel habits. <laughs> you might want to take a natural laxative with you in case something like uh, you get, you know, 
A sitz bath means a sitz bath means you need to sit in hot little little pool for your butt so that the swelling can go down and keep the hemorrhoids that may be external healing. Over the counter medications you need to bring with you. Go ahead. Again. Go ahead. Again. Again. One more time. Everybody's favorite. Traveler's diarrhea. Every country has their name for it. One more time. See all the names? Okay, we'll go ahead and forward. So, most travelers' diarrhea are caused by E. coli, which is the normal bacteria in your colon. It's low grade. They say that 25 to 45 to 50 percent of all currency has E. coli on it. So, just think about that. Washing hands, we're going to all become OCD. We're going to wash our hands, we're going to bring waterless soap, we're going to bring the little cleansing towelettes, we're going to wash our hands. Every time we go to the bathroom, every time before we eat, we touch our food, we touch anything. It, traveler's diarrhea that is afebrile, that means without a fever, I'll be right with you, and that you are not passing blood, and you know, how many of you have had traveler's diarrhea, regular traveler's diarrhea? I have too. You know it's coming on. <laughs> you, know, you know, you say to yourself, oh my God, oh my God, am I going to throw up or am I going to go to the bathroom? It's usually the act of vomiting or the act of emptying your colon. It's over. It basically is over and then it's fluid rehydration, uh, gets you back to where you need to be. The treatment for this is Imodium which is over the counter, or some people still like Pepto-Bismol and it does work. Fluid and electrolyte replacement, and you need to know how to do that. Karen? Yeah, I was just saying that someone recommended this to me, and it's been great, actually. Because I'm a, uh, I eat with my hands, yep. food, and stuff like that. And it's uh, it was actually about money. Yep. And every time you'd have to use handle money to just take out a little of that, you know, yep. stuff, and do your hands. And I, I have to say that it has really made difference. Yes, in a lot of parts of the world, you, you do eat with your hand, and you only eat with your right hand. You never eat with your left hand. It's very bad to do. Uh, I actually had a friend who came up with, a, I think, a really good thing, too, and that is uh, she never travels without chopsticks, her own. Um, and she calls it her chopstick diet. She's always stay thin because of it, too. <laughs> you get tired doing this. You can't, you know, you know. It's, it's like, so that's another way, individual having your own utensils. Okay, go ahead. Um, for this, I found charcoal pills. They sort of work, they don't, you don't want to take charcoal all that. Here was another, go ahead. Go ahead. Now we're going to talk about the difference between a normal traveler's diarrhea and a bacterial dysentery, which is a whole different thing. A bacterial dysentery is bacteria, the large organisms such as E. coli again, but in large dose, Salmonella, Shigella, Campylobacteria, Klebsiella, a lot of organisms cause this. What you do is you feel great, you eat the meal that's tainted, and within a very short period of time, maybe just a couple of hours, you're violently ill. High fever, 101 or better, chills and ongoing, what our doctors like to call, torrential diarrhea. <laughs> and blood in your stool. Blood in your stool is key. If you're seeing blood in your stool, you say, hello, this isn't normal, and you need an antibiotic. Now, you will find on the country sheets when you come in to go over your stuff, Many of them recommend you take a prescription along with you, like Cipro, depending on the country you're going to, because um, there's growing resistance even to Cipro and, and bacterial dysenteries, and that's something you should think about. Fluid and rehydration is critical with this, too. Go ahead. Again. Go ahead. We love amoebas, giardia, and worms. We just love them. In Vermont, it's a very boring state. The lab says, oh, thank God you sent me something that just did once in a while. So what they do is they give you a whole variety of the symptoms. Some may be similar to 
traveler's diary or bacterial dysentery, it just doesn't go away. The other thing you will notice is you will get maybe anal itching, perianal itching, loss of weight, you pass very foul gas, you belch very foul things, uh, and the treatment is specific to the organism. So you have to have your stool cultured. There's no universal anti-parasitic drug for everything. They have to identify the parasite to treat the proper one. Okay, go ahead. Again. Okay, purifying water. Boil it for five minutes. Uh, purification filters with charcoal and other things. They've got some really good, they have a lot of work, people. If you haven't used a good filter and you want to give a liter of water, you've got to set aside some time, man. It is not fast. Iodine works. It's 10 drops of 2% iodine and a liter of water. Wait 30 minutes. In the United States, we chlorinate all water, including that in Brattleboro, by chlorine. Regular bleach. Two drops in a liter of water. Wait 45 minutes. You can buy portable water or halazone tablets to do the same thing. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, to be it's not about water. I say it all the time. So, whoop, back. Uh, you need, the Peace Corps puts it best. They say boil it, bake it, peel it, cook it, or forget it. It's their mantra. If you do this, it works. Stick with those things. You don't want raw cut. I know we all love our salads. And I know you're going to beautiful places where they have salads. But somebody handled those salads. The salads were probably fertilized with only God knows what, so they grow so beautiful and lush. Uh, you do not have any unpasteurized milks. That's even cheeses. It's got to be cooked or processed. And, and you need to be aware of proper food handling. So if you're a snob about water, I don't care what part of the world, what world you're in, you might be having water from New Zealand or from Italy or from France or whatever. It helps, and they reseal and sell water. So it's got to have a tight, fresh seal, otherwise you can't go with it. Go ahead. Again. Go ahead. This is a toxin that's carried in fish. So you have to be a little bit careful about certain fish all over the world. Chigwood terror is a toxin. Cannot be cooked out of fish. Everybody's heard of the puffer fish, which is in sushi that kills like four people a year. The chigwitera toxin probably has a lot more. It's a reef fish, most likely. So wherever you travel before you eat the fish, it's a good idea to check out what's safe and what's not. Yes? I have this in Barracuda on the reefs of Belize. It is horrid. Thank you for <laughs> saying so. It is absolutely horrid. It is. Go ahead. I actually eat Barracuda. Yeah, there's it's really called, it's, you know, it's... it's Right off it's Russian roulette, yeah, yeah. like all this stuff. Is the mosquito biting you carrying disease or not? Is the barracuda you're about to eat carrying disease or not? It's how much precautions you want to take. Go. This is how you make your own oral rehydration. Yes, you can buy it. Those little packages of Gatorade that's dehydrated pack easily. You just got to put twice as much water in it. It's a little too much sugar, but it has potassium, it has salt, and it has calcium and sodium. If you want to make your own homemade solution cheap, it's a half a teaspoon of salt, a half a teaspoon of baking soda, four teaspoons of any type of sugar into a liter of sterile water makes a very good rehydration fluid. Remember you need to drink adequately so that you can pass light colored urine every two hours and that your mouth is moist, you're not thirsty, and your skin is resilient, which means if you pull your skin like I'm doing, it goes back. When you pull your skin, it doesn't go back. It means you're dehydrated. Okay? Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. So you need to replace fluids and electrolytes. Bring antidiarrheal medications with you. Check about carrying antibiotics. And seek medical help if your diarrhea continues. Uh, if you have bloody stews or is prolonged. I actually had one of our students call me, a young woman who was a little plump when she went on her trip, and she sort of liked having traveler's diarrhea because she lost like 40 or 50 pounds. But then when she called me, she says, I can't walk anymore. 
she was so dehydrated. So you really, this isn't a good way, this isn't a good weight loss program. This is better, you know, you really got to check it out and get rid of whatever's going on with you. Go ahead. Okay, I'm just mentioning this because we know about emerging infections. Be aware, no matter what part of the world you're going in, there are emerging infections. We had SARS, remember last year, H1N1. And just be aware of where you're going. Go ahead. Yeah. I have to tell you, what I see more than anything else people traveling, coming back with, is skin disorders. They, you need to be sure not to go barefoot because you can pick up worms and all kinds of things from your feet, especially on beaches and other places. You need to bathe daily and keep your body <coughs> clean and be able to be completely dry off. If you're in parts of the jungle, you need to be able to, to iron your clothes so any possible larvae that's laid on there are killed. You need to treat infections early. Skin infections treated early, you get better results than if you're chronically always treating something. And again, throw away those socks and dirty shoes that keep reinfecting you. Go ahead. Again. Sunburns today are skin cancers tomorrow. We know that. I stay up for 25 years. Use sunblock, the 15 or better. Sunglasses that are good. Hats, zinc, etc. for your nose. Go ahead. In my suggested medical kit, you fill up the page, these are some of the things I suggest you bring. Extra glasses or contacts, sterile bandages, band-aids, moleskin, something to clean a wound, antiseptic soap, scissors, tweezers, and a Swiss Army knife. Not for self-surgery, but for making bandages, etc. Those baby towelettes that are not perfumed can be what you can use. They, they, you know, there's a whole bundle of them, maybe that's how you want to use it. Um, is a good thing. Need something for fever or pain, aspirin or acetaminophen, whatever. Something for sunscreens. If you know you're going to be traveling on buses or ferries, you might need motion sickness medicine. Antihistamines, decongestants, water purification supplies, insect repellents, antacids, antidiarrheals, and natural laxatives. Go ahead. Again. Okay. You need a thermometer. You need to know if you have a fever or not, especially with diarrhea. You need a teaspoon or tablespoon to, move, to uh, measure uh, if you made your own rehydration stuff. A good daily vitamin, because you may not be getting an adequate diet in for yourself. Know and bring your own electrolyte replacement stuff. Mosquito netting, if you're going to be in a malaria side of the world. All your own prescriptions and a whistle. Why a whistle? Lost, lost or something. Or I put this in because most people aren't aware you should have a whistle with you right now. If you go out or hike in the woods and fall down and get hurt, you can only scream so long, but you can practically whistle forever. Go ahead. Okay. Get yourself in shape before you go. Even learn a little first aid. You can at least know how to uh, do the Heimlich maneuver on yourself and save yourself. Learn where in country you can get good medical care. On the papers I give you, there is um, the U.S. Embassy numbers are listed, so you can call and see where they go. But there's also doctors in country that should be available that are our study abroad medical directors and stuff like that. Get immunized properly, and you can work towards preventing jet, jet lag and preparing. Go ahead. How much further do you want me to go? Huh? How much further do you want me to go? I don't know what's going on. Love so, but it's five minutes. All right, do you want to take any questions? Yeah, why don't we take some questions at this point, because I only have five more minutes. Go ahead. How can I find out my blood type? Well, the cheapest, that's actually free, way to do it is have your blood drawn at a drawing and find out what your blood type is. Have you ever given blood? Uh, tomorrow, 11 to 5, the Yelp downtown. Well, if you're given blood, they type you and check you the first, they'll check you every time. But they'll check you the first time and let you know. Blood typing is an expensive thing to get done. Uh, I would say 50 or 75 dollars to have a typing. Cheapest is give give blood, and then they'll tell you. Other questions? Other questions? Yes. So where did you get all of those information from? Where did I get it? Yeah. I am part of the International Society of Travel Medicine. I've been a travel medicine expert for close to 30 years. This information we gather from the World Health Organization, 
the Centers for Disease Control, other health organizations, um, and the State Department. Um, well, thanks for the presentation. And it was nice to And that's a very good point, and let me explain why that is in a lot of cases. There is rarely a place in America you can't turn a faucet on and drink the water. There are some places where there is unsafe water in America, but pretty much 99% of the places you can't. We do find statistically, not just us, here in SIT or the CDC, but the World Health Organization has done great studies. The one study by a group of Swiss doctors finding travel around the world and following their, their Swiss compatriots and how they get sick everywhere. We don't have immune immunity because we have not had the resistance that a lot of people who live in indigenous countries develop. What do you mean to my it's good, the information is great, but then a lot of people was like laughing and stuff like that. I just want to mention, those people that live in Africa and Asia, they are living, they are living, they're not infected with disease or have virus or so, so we should be very cautious of how we go about giving information and how we give information. Well, I take that as good criticism, but like I said, I, I, t I see enough people in travel, and they come back and tell me, oh, I did get sick because I ate this, well, or I, I did get sick. US, I took sick. My first one because I had to adjust to the... That's right. It, it, the thing yeah. reverse happens. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly the same thing happens. Every year when it gets to be... Actually, this is the first year in the last four, I didn't have someone in the first two weeks present with malaria because it's one of those things. When you travel, things change. And people's... Uh, their own internal immune system says, Hello. We're in a different place, and I'm coming. When you get a cold in winters, or not you specifically, but some people, it's something you haven't been exposed to year after year after year. We're in the Northeast exposed to cold bugs all the time. So we get to develop some resistance. But we don't have resistance to certain things like tropical diseases, because there, it just practically doesn't exist in certain parts of the world. So that's where that goes. And yes, food and digestion is much different. The, p the places you'll go and eat will be much different coming here or going there. I myself camped out for three or four weeks um, in Tanzania, mostly in Kenya and Uganda, and I didn't get sick at all. But I followed every rule I just said. Because I was doing a research project, I thought it would look terrible if I did get sick, and was very, very cautious. The people in my group, Everybody got sick but me. So it's one of those things. Any other things? I just wanted to, just to speak to that. Is I, I found also some friends of mine from India who have all these resistances and have all of this stuff, and they spend some time in the United States. They go back to India, and that's that's it. They 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 are their their systems have Americanized. In, in well, they do, and the same thing happens with malaria when they go back. They're they're much more susceptible again. Um, for whatever reason. Right, they're like, I never got Deli Billy, and I did this when I was there. No. So. Yeah, it, you know, and, it, it, and I don't mean to be offensive to anybody, but I'm just laying it out there. Yes? When I took uh, malaria medication before, um, I was on one, one the whole time I was away, and then we had to take the Primaquin. Primaquin. To, like, just in case it was in our system. Terminite. To your terminize yourself. Do you recommend yourself. doing that? No. Um, only if you've had malaria. We only do that now only if you've had malaria and it has been typed as there are four types of malaria and we primarily do that for the one that's called Vivax which is the repetitive malaria. Other questions? Yes? We can come see you for Yep. 3358, make an appointment. We make them appointments and we go over your personal immunization, health history, and give you whatever you need. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank
So Linda, are you going to take that or? I think I'm supposed to do. 